press the record button. So you're all set. Okay, so I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of September 15, 2023 to order. And uh, it's uh, now four minutes after one o'clock. And uh, I just um, want to note that this meeting is being held uh, by remote means, um, which is permitted now by the current Christian uh, Open Meeting Law, but we do need to make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. Um, so I'm going to just go through the members present and uh, start with uh, Matt. Uh, present, thanks. Yeah, and Anna. Present. And Lynn. Present. Kathy. Here. So I want to note that at the moment, um, Councillor Walker is at present, and we have two resident members who I don't think will be here at all today. Um, uh, one for sure, um, I'm certain about is Bob Hegner, and I don't expect Bernie Kubiak um, either based on an email yesterday. So um, we um, want to um, proceed, however, because we have an important agenda and we need to get through. And I also um, know that um, there's other conflicts that are uh, rounds of people. Um, one member is going to uh, may not stay. I I think that um, what I'd like to do is um, when we get to the main agenda item for today's discussion to bring Councillor Haneke into the meeting also. But I uh, want to start by um, asking for public for comment and um, open up for public comment. And uh, um, if anybody who's in the attendee list who would like to make public comment to the committee, um, please raise your hand and then um, we'll bring you in. Uh, Renata Shepard. Um, hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm Renata Shepard, live on Justice Drive in Amherst, and um, I sent an email to the committee, which I'll, you know, I'll go over it now for, you know, public record. Um, and I did send information about other towns that I'm sure CRC must have seen that, I don't know, but um, other towns charge for their rental registration permit. Like Worcester charges 15 per unit, Boston charges 25 per unit, a maximum of 2,500 per building. Uh, Salem charges $50 and well, Amherst 250 plus 150 for inspection, um, which is just seems wrong to me. <laughs> uh, in addition to those fees with the links that I've sent, um, I'd like to offer a suggestion. Um, if you, what if you charge the permit fee per bedroom? For instance, the permit, uh, the permit is my parcel to reduce paperwork, but the fee would be per bedroom. Studios and one bedrooms, for example, $25, two bedrooms, $50, and so on. Uh, there would be no uh, parcel cap, especially if the fee is 25 or less. I mean, I, I'm assuming People would not complain, even if it, there's several units. Um, this way, a two-bedroom duplex would pay $100, the same as a four-bedroom house, and less if one of the duplexes is owner-occupied, benefiting small local landlords. In Amherst, each bedroom is marketed between $800 and 1000 although we've seen the outliers, you know, the, the $2,000 for studios for the newer fancier places um, per month. So a $25 fee per year is not exorbitant. Um, there would be no need to discount Amherst small landlords and the cost for bigger properties would be reasonable. Uh, when this reduce or eliminate bias and legal challenges, because then you're not dealing with um, you know, people challenging, saying, oh, why are you giving discount for this person and not that person? 
Inspection fees should also be considered in terms of property size, accessories, condos, studios take less time, therefore should have a smaller fee than a five bedroom house, for instance. Um, I also believe this rental registration shouldn't be generating any surplus. Part of the cost should be shared by in-town colleges who have off-campus students where the most complaints happen. Um, and even if marginally, also by our already very high property taxes, uh, both renters and affected neighbors would benefit from a fair system. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comment. As, um, it was helpful that you were here to offer that in person. And thank you. Are there other comments from other people in attendance who would like to offer comment to the committee at this point? Um, seeing no request for comment, um, can we bring Mandy into the meeting as um, because she'll be a resource? And do we know whether Rob Morris is going to be present today? I didn't ask him to attend this meeting. I can reach out and see if he's available now. I don't know if there would be. Um, let him know in any event that the meeting is happening because he has uh, an interest in uh, anything. He, he, uh, Rob has an interest in what we're doing. Uh, but we did want to get Mandy uh, to be able to join us, and uh, she's here. So, um, I just want to uh, start with just one observation and then open it up for committee discussion. Um, and that is that uh, I think what we're dealing with is a very complicated problem that CRC spent an extraordinary amount of time um, delving into both what the purpose of the program is, how to go about achieving the principal goals that um, they were trying to achieve in crafting um, a revision to the program, and uh, then uh, how to pay for it. And uh, receiving uh, comment along the way, um, and it got to the point where they were looking for help to think through the financial side of it. and. Uh, we're now in the position of um, kind of trying to come to the same level of understanding that CRC did, which, you know, I'm wondering about um, in retrospect about the process, whether we would have been better working together earlier or something. But um, I think that there's some, what, what we're coming to is that, um, and I think that it was the observation has been made fairly strongly that um, the program is a fairly comp is an extraordinarily comprehensive program and has a high cost to it. And we're talking about adding a program that, according to Sean's calculations and what we've heard from Rob previously, is running you know well over four hundred thousand dollars a year to run, and that that's um, a difficult program to pay for. And uh, uh, it's a question of whether that's really something that the town can take on. And I think that's what we're struggling with. So with that sort of context, I was wondering, um, I know Kathy's been giving some thought to it. And, um, and uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to follow up this next comment or Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Okay, um, I actually started to play with the spreadsheet and decided I had to think separately because I wanted to change some of the boxes. Um, so I had a I had a couple thoughts, um, and um, it, I thought it was very useful to be sent some links to a few other places just to see the fees and the inspection fee structure, um, which is what I was looking for, rather than all parts of it. Um, so um, in in general, I feel like we've got to figure out a way to target, and I said this last uh, week, target 
on properties of concern, minimize the cost for applying and for inspecting where there isn't any serious concern or even minor concern, minimize the cost in both ways on the um, property owner and on the town. So I thought um, we could work with, and this is where if Rob's not here, Mandy, I know you were walking back and forth with the spreadsheets. What I saw in a few places that if if you applied the first time you got your rental registration fee, there was one fee level. When you renewed it, it was half. And that was in the Boston example. And so I think the assumption is once you do the paperwork and it's online, you can look at it and it's a minimal amount of effort, computer time, staff time or anything else. If nothing changed, you just say it's the same. Um, it's like renewing some of the other things that we've had. So cutting the renewal rate, so leaving it an annual, um, but cutting the renewal rate down in half and doing it um, probably for both the owner-occupied and the non-owner-occupied. And I did think this category in between of local owner-owned is a difficult one. So I, I was wondering if we should just get rid of that one and try to vary, vary the unit registration such that if you only own a few properties and you're not living in them, it's a minimal cost to you. Then what I... What I um so and then trying to really make sure it's streamlined. And then what I saw, and you've done it in effect in the spreadsheet, is charging a marginal cost for the additional units if you're a multi-unit place with a maximum. And uh the maximums that were in the spreadsheet were eleven hundred and a little over two thousand. I think there's any kind of range. Um, and I do that more on the cost of running this program. So the lower end would on just the registration. So I was starting to play play with some of these numbers, but really trying to streamline that. Um, Boston, by the way, the initial is twenty five dollars and the renewal is fifteen. Um, you know, so when I was looking around, but they fixed them a while ago. So then on the inspection. Um, that's where I think it's that's the time intensive and that's where the town costs will be high if we have a lot of inspectors. Um, and so, again, trying to think of a way to target it. Um, and if I don't I think we're not planning on doing inspections if it's owner occupied because I didn't see an owner occupied inspection fee. And I think that's a good idea. Um, I do think we should be excluding. Uh, the federal and HUD ins, 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 inspected, and we were sent in a public written comment account on how many of those. They go through a pretty rigorous inspection. I know um, Rob Moore didn't agree with me when I raised that last time, but in several of the other town codes, those are excluded. So we don't we don't reinspect places that are being inspected. So trying to think of the list of that excluded, then. Then trying to think of per parcel and for additional units and making the additional units uh, marginal pretty small. So you had an example of 150, but only do a random sample and do it only once. Um, and so uh, so that if I'll give a an example, if it's a 50 unit building um, or a 100 unit building, you do a random sample, the basic systems are great, they get a five-year um, waiver on another inspection. And you just do a random sample. And whether it's 10%, I, you know, some small number, that would cut down on the some number of units we're, we're inspecting. And if it's a clean bill of health, it's just a five-year, now you're on the five-year cycle, unless something changes. Um, and it would be the same if it's a duplex, you know, that, that five-year would be a, if it, you're clean, you're up to five year. Then the other thought I had is the startup versus steady state issue. If we phased it, so I, I started to try to put some mem, uh, but I wanted to talk about these conceptually. If we phase this and said, we're, roll, we're starting the program up, not all at once. Um, so we do, we set up the registration, you know, that's however, whatever we're going to do. But on the inspection side, we phase it in. 
And so I don't, and then I went with what would be a logical way of phasing it in. For starters, I would do any property that, that has been of concern in the past. We've got a list that we think are, pro, are problem houses. I'd love a category called problem house. Um, and a problem house or rental is one with any kind of physical problems, uh, health and safety, multiple police calls, multiple noise calls, something Boston's got a really nice category that boots up the codes. But start with that and then maybe, maybe um, whatever is legal, that if we started with uh, <laughs> single family homes that are not owned locally, <laughs> Um, you know, just to cut down on the size. And then a second round could be bigger units and a third round, but trying to phase it in a way that we don't need any more than one and a half inspectors a year. So I was looking at cutting the inspection staffing down by half as a, as a beginning place. Um, so, and then with my idea of random, and then by, if we phased it in over five years, by the fifth year, we would have inspected every parcel once. Many of them would be on a five-year cycle because they would have uh, checked out okay. And we would then have a pretty good idea of what we're doing. So that's, I just wanted to, Andy, I don't want to talk a lot more, but I was trying to think of a way of bringing this in to align it. The other one thing I did see in Boston, and it may be they can do this because they're a bigger city, but maybe in our region, they have a list of certified inspectors. So if they need more inspectors in a year or a complex, they're certified, you can pick one of these people. Um, and so the inspector has to do it at the level that the town would do it, but, but they didn't staff up to do all the inspections. Then my other comment, um, and I didn't want to jump into how does everybody else do it, but it looked to me like what Burlington is doing, and then inspection and reinspection fees really focus again on the problem houses. So Burlington has a um, a gradation. If you're check out okay, you get you don't get inspected again for five years. If it's very minor and you can correct it and this is mainly at the housing code, then you get a four-year certificate. And I'm not sure I want to go at this level, but it's if you are a major problem, it's and they talk about it, dilapidated health and safety codes, um, and you're not shut down, you get six months, and then you have to be reinspected and there to to try to catch up. So they do a a more frequent, you know, hit them again if they've identified the place as really dangerous um, in habitation. So all of this is to try to figure out a way is that we're mainly using our inspectors to try to address places that we think are putting the inhabitants at risk or putting the neighborhood at risk in terms of trash, noise, other kinds of problems. Then the only other comment I wanted to make, and I think you had done this in some of the regs, but the complaint-driven inspection, in at least a couple of them, a complaint didn't generate an inspection fee for the owner if it turned out that there wasn't anything there. <laughs> you know that it, you know, so that you don't get into some kind of dispute between landlords and tenants that are frivolous complaints. Um, so you don't try to incur a a visit, you know, complaint, my plumbing is a mess, you know, where it gets you inside the house, it turns out to check out okay. So those were just thoughts on the two things to try to figure out a way if we can focus, get the fees way down. So one of our sheets, option one, the permit fee was $50 for the, the small units, um, the owner occupied units. And then the the um, the next step up was five dollars. Playing with any of those, Bernada just gave us another way of playing with them. But trying to get the fees generated, yeah. over the cost. And I'll stop there, Andy. The one other thing, Lynn, you had mentioned um, retaining any surplus. We might have to have an enterprise fund. I wanted to check whether we have any ability in the town because Burlington retains it in a fund without calling it an enterprise fund. That may be okay in Vermont. I don't know whether it's even possible to do it 
in Massachusetts. But Burlington had a paragraph that literally said, you know, if their funds remain at the end of the year, they roll over and they may adjust the fees if they don't need as much revenue to cover. That's it. Yeah, Holly would have to answer that one. Um, I One quick um, observation about what's going on in this conversation, and then I would see you at, um, if uh, Lynn had something she was started to raise her hand, and that is that uh, we're sort of been getting into a very uh, difficult territory because CRC really did a lot of work and proposed a bylaw and then referred, you know, a piece to us that they specifically wanted, plus we're generally look at financial sides of things anyway. But uh, we don't, um, should we be, I think we have to sort of come to grips with whether we ought to be putting ourselves in the position of um, redoing CRC's work or how that happens. And that's, it, it's an additional piece of discussion that I think that we need to have and that uh, Lynn is uh, president of the council and might have some comment on. Um, but um, if, uh, if uh, I'm gonna look now to see if Lynn, Mandy or anyone else raises hands. Lynn? Um, actually, I'd like Mandy to go first. Man, Mandy. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily want to get into too much on the substantive of what finance is asked to be decided because I'm not on finance, but just a couple of things that, that might help given some of Kathy's comments. Um, the CRC did discuss the initial application and then a, re a renewal application permit fee being different. Um, the it, it didn't end up on the Word document fee schedule, but on the samples, um, I think there is a note somewhere that says, um, but maybe it didn't end up there either, that um, that the fee schedule, the, the Excel spreadsheet bases it on the renewal um, because the initial application for a permit happens once per property. And so we can't really base how many fees, the, the revenue on that one um, and so we were basing it on a renewal, but it's a good reminder that I'm not sure that initial one made it into the Word document that would actually be the final schedule. So, so I, I will make note of that, um, or or we should make note of that. And there can be different ones, but but I would just recognize as a committee if you're going to propose dollars, and and I think that's what what the referral was for that those dollars should at least start with the renewal fee because that's the main amount of fees that will be collected every year, not an initial one. Um, but but Kathy is right, and I, I told her this in an email that uh, Rob has confirmed and, and he can correct it if I'm wrong, that once you're in the system, the next year, the renewal, everything pre-populates. So you're just changing the stuff that has changed. Um, so that would be a justification for different and, and there's different things he's also confirmed to crc that there are different amounts of time for staff for an initial application that's never had a permit before and a renewal because of the documents you're submitting and staff is verifying and all um on the inspections it is um uh, the inspection will happen in owner occupied houses they are not exempt from an inspection but the owner occupied unit is exempt under the bylaw and the regulations, but the non owner occupied unit does get inspected under the regulations and bylaw. So I just wanted to clarify that out. Um, uh, Kathy and Rob have talked about the exclusion of the Fed, uh, the HUD inspections and all, and I'll leave Rob if he wants to address that again. The um, Kathy's suggestion that was based on what Rob said last week, I guess it is, about the random sample would be easy for CRC to fix. Um, the, lang the language is in a prior draft <laughs> and the language got tweaked at the end. Um, and I think John Thompson had approved getting into every unit over five years. Um, and I think the original language had every unit over five years, but there is language for samples and do you go back every year or every five years and all of that. So it's easy to put in. And if that's what Rob recommends, I would 
take a guess that CRC would easily make that change uh, because we have CRC has generally followed the recommendations of Robin John in the past. So that one, um, in terms of a, a way to potentially reduce how many inspections would happen, um, could easily be made a change in the regulations. Um, the fee schedule Excel spreadsheet would have to have numbers updated and linked things updated to give a better accurate um, guesstimate as to how many inspections are happening a year then. Um, so then you wouldn't be able to use the current Excel spreadsheet without some calculations being updated. Um, the phase in that Kathy talked about is actually already there. And so I guess that's where I've had a little bit of confusion, confusion with that conversation, because if I understood Kathy properly, that she would, she, her, 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 she was saying, if I understood properly, that over the course of five years from the date of adoption to five years later, every unit would get inspected. Our regulations actually say the proposed regulations in section B1A1 say for clarity upon adoption of the bylaw, all residential rental property, whether or not they have a prior residential rental permit will need to undergo an initial inspection within five years of the effective date of the bylaw. So we've, we, we have not written a bylaw or regulation that, that would require in year one, every single one of the 1400 parcels to be inspected. It would be over a five year period. And so it's already got that phase in for for the and the renewal inspection and the initial inspection um, uh, steady state, what we don't know in that first five years, and I think Rob would, uh, Rob can speak to that, is of those inspections, when we're doing the initial ones, how many are going to, in that first five years, there's a suspect, a sus, it is suspected that more will fail their first inspection than after five years when you've been in there once. And so that's more, that's the part that I think might require an estimate of more inspectors than going forward five years later. But to get those initial inspections in, the committee has already proposed language that phases all of those in over five years, allowing the inspection services department to choose which ones they go in first. Um, so they would sort of be able to do that choosing that that Kathy had talked about. Um, and I would say I, I will take the or or the the committee, if they're doing the inspection sheets, can take the um, suggestion of if there's no violation found under a complaint inspection that no fee is charged. I think that's a perfectly logical one um, that the CRC did not discuss at all. So I, that would be something that the committee could decide to put in. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, I, I want to make some comments as a finance committee member, and then I actually do want to talk about uh, what Andy has kind of alluded to is how do we look at this from a council perspective. Um, regarding the actual um, issue I believe that the charge to the finance committee is to look at this and figure out how to make it work. Okay. And so I'm actually eking over into from a council perspective, CRC has spent enormous amounts of time on this. I would really regret seeing us walk away from it because we can't figure out how to make it work. I, I think that would be, really unfortunate. And at some point we may have to decide we're going to spend our time on this and not on something else. Um, but I personally have a problem when someone, and I'm not criticizing Kathy that you had to do it this way, but I would like to see the model that you're talking about laid out and versus, for instance, the model that Rob has given us, because I can't I can't absorb all those different numbers and the different changes and so forth. What I got from it, however, is that you're trying to reduce the number of inspectors needed and you're trying to reduce good properties from paying a lot more 
and focusing on properties where there are problems. And I totally support that. Um, so, but from a standpoint of, the, um, I personally, as a counselor, not as president of the council, I would be really disappointed if we can't figure out a model financially to make this work and we walk away from it. That would be, to me, just a real shame. So there you have it. Um, Mandy, you was... Yeah, I, I, I apologize. And if I'm stepping in something I shouldn't, um, let me know. I think... One thing that, you know, if if the committee would or believes that the fee numbers would be more properly discussed at CRC because of CRC's knowledge, um, given all of the conversations you've had and the notes I'm taking about all of it and any other recommendations, um, you know, it, if it would be easier for finance to say things like, this part of the structure we like, this part we don't. Um, Rob's suggestion about sampling the larger units over a five-year period instead of getting into every unit over five years is one that's good and would reduce costs. And then say something like, and of the total cost that Rob projects or that Sean projected at some point, um, modified for the whatever modification CRC might make with those recommendation changes, we recommend that CRC or somebody suggest a structure that covers 100% or 80% or 50% of the estimated value or 100% minus X specific dollar amount because we're going to cover that dollar amount within some other funding mechanism and then if 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 finance would find it easier to do something like that, I think CRC could work with that type of recommendation to come back with an actual fee schedule. Um, but if I'm stepping into roles that I shouldn't be, I, I'm okay to be ignored, but I, I'm just trying to provide some helpful, potentially helpful things that might be able to move this along. Thank you, Kathy. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that offer, Mandy and Lynn. I completely agree with you that presenting it the way I did for me was totally frustrating as well because I went to the spreadsheet and said, let me just plug in some numbers. And uh, you, from CRC and Rob, we had a lot of useful information, but I couldn't, I didn't have variables that I needed. Mandy, Mandy re referred to it, that if we weren't going to see every unit within a unit, I mean, I know how many parcels there are. And if we weren't going to try to go to all the parcels, but how many parcels are we going to go to? <laughs> and are they big ones or small ones? Because I uh, very nicely gave us numbers on, a, you know, if I'm in a house with several bedrooms, it's going to take me longer to look at it uh, than an efficiency in a building that has just efficiencies, you know, I mean, the efficiency is one room on some level. Um, so you you turn the water on and flush the toilet, on, I guess, turns the lights on and off. I mean, it's it's the, the building then that's the important one, not just the unit. So we, we don't have um, what I would normally have to be able to do that. So I had it when we were playing with the four buildings, which we're, we're in the millions of dollars, we're in the we're in the hundred thousand dollars here, um, where I had, um, what if I did this, that, or the other thing? Um, so so in, in doing this, I did have some, um, what I heard from you, Mandy, I didn't read it that way, but it was good to hear that, that we're basically, trying after over a period of five years to get into every building. Let me talk at building. Then if I say we're not necessarily getting into the units within the building, we're doing a random sample and then we don't go back. So those, the first round of them, if there anyone that checks out, they're not. So that was, um, I was trying to get both the registration fee and the inspection fee down 
for the problem-free houses and or, uh, dwellings. And that's where I don't have enough. And that was my first question of Rob on the rough guess of how many problems do we have out there? And he said, we only know kind of the nuisance houses that we've repeatedly gone back to. We we haven't been in to most of the others. Um, so so that's the... Um, that that's the uh the revolving door question here you know do we have out of the the property list it was the data you gave us was great i just can't um do the subsets of it um easily but of of the actual units um we've got a how many buildings do we have it's about 1200 um parcels or 1100 parcels so if we were saying 1100 parcels and we're only doing a fifth of them each of the first each year and then it's it's kind of a question of what the costs are so it may be mandy we have to set it up with blanks and then have rob do what he was doing for you you know if my first year as the building inspector would be these kinds of places you know not not the big hundred plus units, but I'd go to some duplexes. I've got some places on my list that I'd love to have been able to get inside of. I don't, you know, that's where I don't know if we do a fifth, but hearing that it can be phased, that was what I was looking for. And then hearing that the numbers you've given us are the renewal, not the initial, then our numbers are in fact on the permit. They're high compared to um, most other places. So and it's the combination of the permit plus the inspection that hits the little one. Um, if they don't have to get re-inspected, that's a one-time piece over a five-year. So, trying to rethink that. So, Andy, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to. I actually tried to avoid reading carefully every word. So that's why I missed Mandy's piece on the thought was phasing. But I think these are the these are the key variables finance should be looking at. You know what? What's the fee to re register and then renew? How much does it vary by the number of units? And is there a cap on it, which has been proposed in the spreadsheet? It doesn't explicitly say that. Um, so it goes up to a certain dollar level. And then the same with inspections, the overall inspection. And then if you're doing a random sample, what? what's that piece those are what generates the revenue and it's also what generates the expense because it's how many times are the inspectors going out to the houses um so uh now i did i did i can come back to crc with the larger things on what are we asking people to report on when they register their apartment or the rental, because I think we've expanded a bit on what we're asking for in the initial registration. But I just have to go back, Mandy, you'll know that better on a, what do we now ask? So is everyone a first time registration because we've redone what we're asking for in the registration. So it's not just a, an affirm what we've got. So we should try to stay on the edge of that, you know, not do a lot of it so that people can re-register pretty simply. So, so Lynn, I agree, you know, you know, doing it in pieces uh, to say, I'd like to cut the inspection staffing in half if I could with my best guess was if we don't have to hit all those little apartments, every single one of them, if we do a, ra a reasonable random sample, but 10% with the, the building might be more than enough. Um, and I don't know what you do with the smaller buildings. And I'll stop there, but I would love to play with numbers. So I just don't have the numbers to play with. <laughs> yeah. Lynn? So Mandy's posed an interesting question. Okay. Does our finance discussion constitute some um, set of things that we would like CRC to go back and look at, okay? And that given the time they've spent on this issue and the fact that there is a model and maybe it's a model that could be improved on, that CRC now spends some time 
on this. And I, I personally have no problem with that. I mean, it's, we've never said, you know, a committee that's not finance can't look at numbers. We've just always said it has to come to finance and it has come to finance. And are there some agreed upon things we would say back to CRC that says, you know, we've looked at this, but we would like you to look at the bylaw in relationship to the financing with the following in mind. And Kathy, I have, you know, if you want to go to CRC and, you know, have a present them with some model, as long as we don't break open meeting law, then I'm fine. You know, just, um, so I, 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 with that, I'd like to know if others on the committee can agree to that. And if that is the case, then I would like us to focus on what are the messages we're sending back to CRC. And I actually have a question for Mandy that um, is sort of in the same line. And that is, uh, during the process, did members of CRC do any extensive examination of other rental registration programs? Uh, where they would got into similar issues about the number of staffing and fees charged? So we had fee, we, we had options for, when we started looking at the options for fees, we did have a document, it, it's since been pulled for cleaned up for what came to council, but there was a document that basically went through and listed what Hartford did for fees on various things and what Boston did. It was in the comments of one of the fee structure documents, but it had a number of different cities and towns and where what they charged for what. And that and that applied to not just um, the in the permit fee or the inspection fee, but but we had notes in there about um transfer of permit fee. You'll actually see some of it in in a, a final, you know, in in the remains in it with comments, but administrative appeal fees, what did other towns do? Some charge nothing, some charge this, where are those ranges? Um, we we had in there, you know, what our current town policy is and stuff like that. So so we did, in looking at the fee schedule, look at and, and have examples from other towns as to what they were doing in terms of inspections. And that, that went with, um, in our discussions with things like, do you charge a permit fee that includes an inspection fee, you know, that includes the inspection fee or not? Does the inspection fee include a return inspection fee because it fails an inspection? Or do you have to pay one another fee if your first inspection got, you know, failed, if you failed your first one, so the inspectors have to come back? How many times do they come back before you're charged a new fee? Um, and we had examples from other towns with all of those sort of permutations as we talked through what makes the most sense. And so some of that talk in, in settling on in particular a permit fee and a separate inspection fee to begin with, that really, you know, that that um, that decision or recommendation that came to the council and you because you have two different tabs was based really on, on in some of the goals that Kathy stated, you know, um, minimizing fees for parcels that do not have health and safety violations because if you roll that inspection fee into an application fee that is paid every year they're paying that fee even when they're not getting an inspection um and things like that so so we did have those conversations um in terms of extensive examination of other programs as we wrote the bylaw um we spent uh, we, we referenced state college a lot i will say that but we also looked at salem we looked at boston we looked at hartford we did look at a number of others within massachusetts and out where we had those inspection fees and all to to look but but state college was one of the initially one of the primary um models that we looked at it doesn't actually look anything like state colleges anymore um but we we used our own current model too so i hope that helps it does um i think that what i've been thinking about is i've looked at some of these examples like we were uh, um, directed 1.2 worcester and boston and salem um each of those are different communities um 
you know, and I know something about Salem from having heard our lieutenant governor, who was mayor of Salem, um, speak on several occasions. And, uh, you know, the, the rentals there and their bylaws written around short term rentals, because a lot of, you know, they seem to be focusing on um, uh, short term rentals as opposed to long term rentals for students. Um, they have, a, you know, it's, it's a tourist industry town to a large extent. Um, then, you, you know, Boston and Worcester are so large that they're unique. We're unique because uh, most of our, uh, such a large percentage of our rentals are, are university students. And uh, so each community has a different set of circumstances and, uh, it's hard to look at these other examples and say that they exactly fit our particular set of problems because they uh, they just don't. Um, so that's one um, piece in, in, in the you've done some work and particularly what you learned from State College because that's probably with all of the communities that have been mentioned, the ones that's the closest to us um, in the unique circumstances that we're dealing with. Uh, it would be helpful to have anything that you were able to find out and know about it so we don't have to reinvent the wheel on it. Um, another issue that I want to uh, look to so we have time is that uh, I had uh, asked, uh, we usually don't put public comments into our packet and uh, it's not something that we want to do as a regular thing, but we did receive the one item from the um, pre the uh, president or chair, whatever his role is of the uh, Landlords Association and uh, which went fairly extensively into one particular issue, which Kathy mentioned, which is um, federally inspected properties. And uh, uh, I think that it is worth spending a little bit of time um, to see uh, if uh, Rob has had a chance to look at that. And if not, uh, to make sure that we uh, have an opportunity to talk about it after Rob has had a chance to uh, to look at that particular comment, which is in the packet. So, anybody have a direction they want to go in at this point? Otherwise, um, yeah, Kathy. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait to see you, but, but I liked Lynn's suggestion, um, and I'd be happy to do kind of a, a draft for us to consider of what we want to look at. Um, I just wanted to put one other city on your list, Andy. I totally, of course, agree that if we had apples to apples on places, we would love to have them. But um, Burlington was the other place I looked at because... Uh, in proportion to the city, their their university isn't as big, but the it it's it's a very dense um, rental, and it's a high rent place. So um, so I did like the idea, Lynn. I think what I heard you say is that we set down some parameters we want to have looked at that we haven't already seen with some goals. So I my my starting point is, can we cut it down to one and a half inspectors? You know, I just was thinking, can we make this program smaller? And, and how would we do that? So I went to the random sample method and my random was how small a sample would we need to make that feasible? And then, you know, so, and then I didn't have the variables to do anything with it. Um, and, and so, and, and Aunt Mandy, I completely agree with splitting the registration fee from the inspection fee, because ideally the smaller ones would only see the inspection fee every five years. And it could be a, it could be a quicker, when we talk about re, recertifying the permit, it might be a quick second inspection too. If you've got a clean property, you're only, you're gonna look at it quickly. 
So I did like thinking it through that way, Lynn, if the rest of the committee was willing to do it. And I'm willing to be, a, a, what do we call it, a, um, an informal member of CRC at the point they're specifically looking at this modeling because it's it's what I like to do and I, I would follow it. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think we have to vote on it, but just trying to think of the variables and what information, um, I'd be happy to do that. So I didn't know whether others like that idea or not. I did, in fact, like that idea rather than trying to uh, recapture information CRC may already have. And already, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to have Rob Moore and his team generate for us things they've already generated for CRC, where with small changes, we're in, in the same ballpark. Um, so Andy, you raised the, uh, Rob came in, spoke strongly about not wanting to exempt them. And I wasn't sure why, but we did get, I do see the other, the places that are already being inspected, why not exempt? You know, I'm trying to make the number of inspections as small as possible is where I'm drilling down on. Um, and I see no reason to re-inspect, have town inspect a place that's been inspected. I can understand if the whole building isn't being inspected, but just a few units are, maybe you you look at the rest of the building. So I'll stop there. But Lynn, I like that that suggestion a lot. And that would focus us just on a, what do we want to see? And if we reach agreement of that, then we ship it back over to CRC. Lynn? Did you? Yeah, unless I hear from somebody that doesn't want to proceed with that, given the time crunch we're all starting to feel, uh, I would like to take today's conversation. I've already started a... Uh, page that I can put up on the screen if Athena gives me permission, and we could rapidly agree on what those issues are. We don't meet again for at least another two or three weeks, and that puts us in October, and that puts CRC up, you know, in a bind as well. So I think this today's conversation has captured a lot of what people have said. Just let's get it down on paper and. That's what we do. So, Athena, I need to. People are in agreement. I'm host. host. So you, oh, I am. Yeah, host. you should okay. be able to do that. Okay, then here you go. Um, Finance Committee has looked at the rental registration bylaw proposed by CRC and would like CRC to consider, to consider adjustments to the bylaw that would reduce the number of inspectors needed, exclude or significantly reduce the inspections, reduce inspections of properties already that are already um, subject to inspections, to required inspections. What else? Random sample in larger uh, buildings rather than every unit. And that's where I said, is this 20 units or more? You know, where's what's the threshold of quote larger? And it's pretty easy to look down the sheet and say, where would that be? Um, I think 20 is probably not a bad number, but 10 might be lower too. Um, a, uh, have a lower renewal fee than initial fee. And Mandy said that was already in there, but make it explicit. I'm sorry, give me that one again. A lower. Uh, have a lower renewal fee than initial registration fee. Okay. Um, it, it seems built in. Um, I guess, Mandy, you said the intention was already, but 
phase, I could call it phase in over five years, make it explicit that we're phasing it in over five years. Um, and I don't know where the wording is on. And I, I have to ask just on the, the current way it's set up, if I get a clean inspection, do I automatically get a five year? I'm not coming back because that's the way I'd like it, you know, to be. So just if clean, then then you, you know, unless something happens, uh, it's you you're not inspected again for five years. And I had originally in my note said, why not ten years? I wasn't sure where five came from, but you know, just trying to. Uh, everything was reduce the number of inspectors needed. And I think I think those are the main variables I'm just looking at in their sheet. You know, the the there were the fees that are their variations, Lynn. So just as you're typing, it's, you know, the if I go into a big building, or a multi-unit building, there's the, I go into the building, here's the inspection fee, then there's so much for each unit. And I don't know um, how those numbers were come up with, but the last one I would, I'd like this to be self-financing. So maybe that's, so I think they were looking at self-financing. <laughs> And I want to add to that and not revenue generating. And not revenue generating, right. Uh, Mandy Joe, you've listened to our conversation. How would you, what would you add? What would you note? So I would love to hear the conversation on Kathy's suggestion of self-financing. Um, that was one of the areas that CRC got stuck on and wanted input from finance on whether the program should be fully self-financing or whether the taxpayers as a whole um, should incur some of the costs of the program through property tax receipts. Um, so I'd love to have finance, we'll, we'll, we'll do what finance recommends, but that was one particular area where CRC, I will say CRC felt unequipped or ill-equipped to have that conversation, not just because we weren't equipped, but that's really more of a finance thing. Um, and also it came up because, um, as you can see in the Excel spreadsheets, fully self-financing put some numbers up there that we were in some sense fairly uncomfortable with in terms of the price and the costs of the fee, the fees themselves to get it up to self-financing. Um, and so that was one of the impetuses for coming to finance. So I'd love that conversation. Some of the other bullet points in some sense are already written into the regulations and maybe not the bylaw, but um, I, it, it's fine for you to keep them there uh, because we can relook at some of them. So, so let me uh, follow up on what Mandy just said, because there are a couple of things that I was thinking about. Um, Lynn, uh, keeping typing, but um, not in the bullet sort of going out to the left where you have the finance committee has looked the very thing at the beginning. Um, start it's the new things that are not just um, that are a little bit different. One is that we might want to create because I mean this could actually be a very useful uh, document as far as where we're going to go, what what issues we've identified and steps we want to take. Um, Kathy had raised a question earlier and I had posted to Holly and um, she really hasn't been able to get at it, but it is to determine what um, is the cost and revenue supporting the current rental registration program. And um, I'll tell you what I very specifically have on mind there without you needing to put it down yet in any fashion, but um, the, um, you know, we know that um, 
where was John Thompson's salary being paid for? Was he getting, were, were there any inspection fees that were going into uh, uh, his salary? What were his range of responsibilities for administering the program? And um, it, because I think what I'm really trying to get at is what town re, um, general fund revenues have been going into the rental registration program, if any. And uh, I know that Holly has just been really over the top busy and is trying to do, you know, one and a half jobs, hers and half of uh, uh, Sean's job right now. And she's, uh, this is a difficult time, time of the year. So it's, uh, I, um, we have to be careful about what we ask of anyone including Holly, uh, but it, it would be very helpful to, to have that information. The other thing that we do need to talk about, which is a separate line, um, but is the uh, amount of whether we should be uh, getting some input from uh, Paul regarding the uh, money from the university through the strategic partnership agreement. Uh, that there was that was one of the pieces that was included was just generally the subject of housing, and uh, if a large part of what we're trying to do is make sure that houses being rented to students are safe and habitable, then using some of or all of that what is a hundred thousand dollars is justifiable but that's a dis that that's a discussion that we needed to have as a part of this yeah okay kathy you have your hand up uh yeah i have to go back and listen to the um early the meeting when Sean was still with us at the end of August. Uh, but I believe he gave us the revenue side, uh, Andy, already. Um, and I did a quick math. So Holly said getting the revenue side is really easy. So that is just to make us, we want the revenues that are coming in right now. And then the tougher thing is what, what kind of staffing has gone into either administering the, um, it's not just John Thompson. Lynn, it's also administering the um, when you register the, that system. So we have some pieces of that. So so I, I did like what you added, Andy, on the university, but the the pieces of the current costs are that computer system that captures it. And Rob has a somehow there's a $50,000 legal fee a year for the permit system that we actually have a licensing fee or something for our permit system. So just making sure we, we're, we're getting at the current cost of it. That was the only piece. Yeah. Sean gave us a rent, rent, and I'll just go back and listen to the, the Zoom one because he, he had it because um, I think he anticipated someone would ask it. Well, the amount of fees that we're, we've been collecting, I think, was what my recollection of what that specific reference was. And, um, you know, the question then is, um, if that is not the cost that is, in, is involved with administering the program as it has been, which gets back to, because I think it was really... Um, substantial right. portion, if not the entire portion of John's job, then um, was tax money going into it? Was general fund revenue going into it? So yeah, I, I understand. That's why I asked for the revenue and all the costs. I completely agree, Andy. You know, so we... I just, you know, I think for everybody's sake, it was worth you and I just clarified that. Um, I have one other topic that I want to bring up, but it's really, un, uh, it's a different one. So I was trying to stay with this grouping first, see if there's anything else in that. Because otherwise I'm going to, I'll just go ahead and say what it is. Um, I had a separate contact from uh, one 
uh, property owner. And that property owner was concerned about whether um, adding substantial costs to um, administer to, to running a property would affect what's known as net operating income. And the reason that that's important is that, and this gets into the question of whether we need to also consult Kim Mu, who's our um, uh, assessor, is that when uh, rental property is being assessed, that there are actually alternative methods that can be used uh, for uh, determining what the rent is. And one of them is to look at what the net operating income is as, a, as one of the factors in um, an assessment. And uh, the argument that was basically being made is that um, if the rental operating costs go up and the net operating income is affected, it could affect the assessed value of those properties. And if it did, and it decreased the net um, uh, the assessed value of those properties, it would actually cause taxation on um, residential homes um, to go up. Because that's how uh, that's how the property tax system works. So uh, we really would need to bring the assessor in to ask if that's a real issue. I think I got it. Yeah, and I, and I can... Uh, please read it. <laughs> Basically, what I heard is rental properties might be assessed differently than... The, and they actually, I think they are. They're assessed based on their income. And then the question is, does that lead to a net operating income reduction, which would lead to a decrease in assessment and therefore, owner-occupied homes would be, have to be a set, would bear the burden. Correct. I mean, this also, um, the one that also comes into mind for me in this same category is, is this going to increase rents? That's just a straightforward. Yeah, and I think that's, that is one that I thought about, too. Anna would just put on that. Yeah. A question. It's always, I always struggle with it because truly that is at any point raising the rent is the prerogative of the landlord, right? And so this is one factor that might do it. And I think that it's, it's hard to control. It's not something that we had to ask this question when we voted for the debt exclusion, right? Like this is something that is a constant um, and I think that it, while it's a really, really valid point, we need to make sure we have programs that are available for folks who need rental assistance. And that is where we should be focusing the energy because we cannot control whether landlords are going to raise their prices or not. And while we have really, really great landlords in this town, we also know that this is, I mean, I'm, I'm back on my capitalism soapbox, y'all, but I think ultimately landlords are going to do what they need for to, to make the profit margin that they need to make if that's their intention. And so I, I, I really struggle with that being, it should be a consideration, but ultimately I don't see how we can control for that. Um, I, I agree with that. You we talking. need to do all the other stuff, you know? So, so I, right. I don't think that that's ever going to get the answer that we want it to get is no, ultimately what and, I mean. And, and I think whatever answer we give it is totally and completely hypothetical. And, uh, and, and it shouldn't be, we yes, it's it's hypothetical in both it it might not happen. Um, you know, Anna, just on yours years ago, it was that the minimum wage goes up, prices go up, and the answer was not necessarily. In fact, we had to do ten year retrospective to say no, it didn't happen. Um, 
So I do have a, just Lynn on that first part, I think it's written on the rental, but one of the issues here is that the net operating income of the property is lower. Our tax revenues are lower, you know, so it's, you know, unless it goes up someplace else. Um, so that, that, I think that's written clearly enough, but if, if yeah, this, tax revenues, the assessor it was, needs it, needs it to be explained, we can explain what, yeah. what what we what we mean by that yeah let, let me just explain it real quickly um because i think we uh lynn had it right uh we increase the amount that we are going to tax each year by two and a half percent plus new growth that determines how much we're going to tax which is the town revenue from taxation how that gets distributed then depends upon assessments. And that's where the assessor piece comes in. And so if residential property values fall for any reason, then um, the burden falls on homeowners because that's where it goes up. Right. Yep. So given uh, the reality is that in going back to CRC, it's really the top set of bullets that we would like them to consider. In order to consider it, they may need to look at the second set of bullets. Okay. But the reality is the third set is not necessarily a CRC issue or even frankly, a finance committee issue. I, that's my assessment, but Mandy Jo has her hand up. So I would say the second set of bullet points under revenue is where CRC needs guidance from finance, because I think it's finance's role to recommend, at least on bullet point number two, right? Um, you know, hear from the manager what his plans for that are and recommend then whether that should go forward or not for this program. And if so, how much? Because then CRC can take that number. What CRC really kind of needs is to figure out what number are we aiming for revenue wise. And that that second set of bullet points goes to that. And I think it's a it it's within finances purview to make that recommendation, not within CRC. CRC can come up with a fee schedule recommendation once we know what revenue we're aiming for. One other question, Mandy, I had of you is, uh, did you do any inquiry with the International Town Gown Association as far as uh, whether they have any resources developed in this area to help communities with this sort of, uh, setting up this sort of program? No, um, not specifically. The ITGA has recently had a number of webinars about things towns can, and municipalities, ways to address um, college demands um, on, on college towns. And I, no, many of our committee members were watching all of them. So indirectly, but not directly. Um, interesting. Kathy. Um, yeah, yeah, Mandy, just on a, you know, I think our first bullets are clear, but I was, um, Lynn, if you don't mind, I'd like to see if we can, can we come up with a way of doing the, the reduce the number of inspections needed is reducing the number of inspections. Those go together. But I was going to see, can we can we get down to 1.5? You know, I was going to try to get it from three down to 1.5. What would it take to do that? Um, and the answer may be impossible. But instead of tripling the staff for this going up. So that was the one point. One and one point five. One and a half a person would be really a miracle. Um, and then you know the it's the combined costs on the non problem. So it's that interaction between the they they pay their premium registration and they pay their one time 
hopefully one time inspection fee every five years, you know, trying just playing with that right now. I think it's, is it 150 Mandy right now that the, when we went up on the re registration fee, I think I'm just, I think we're 150 for owner occupied and 250 for non-owner occupied right now. You know, so if we go down on the registration fee, because we're including a, a separate inspection fee, trying to see how much we can keep that fairly neutral. Is, is that a is that a bullet that people are willing to do, you know, for the um, for the owner occupied? So if they're at 150 now, the combination trying to not make it any more than 150 between the what they pay for registration, what they pay for was just a trying to. As, as a potential. I was looking at- To figure at, out which bullet you want me to go to, or is this a new bullet? Um, if you put do another bullet, Kim, is there a way uh, for the owner occupied keeping the combination of the registration fee and the inspection fee to be no more than what they're paying now? And I think Perhaps it happens as long as they only have to do the inspection fee once every five years. So it's new. It's basically trying to make it neutral for 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 an, uh, compared to current. We're not paying any more than current. You know, yeah. sir, it'd be helpful to know and to get input from landlords as to if you're looking at that combination in the way you just stated it, would they prefer an even amount per year or do they, um, would, is it better to have a lower registration fee each year and then that once every five year uh, larger amount? I don't know, and that's where I asked, you know, could the reinspection for an otherwise clean, pro what's the right word, co-compliant property is probably less intensive. You know, is there a different, is there a different rate for a reinspection of a good, of a good property? Um, I don't, problem-free property. <laughs> trying to yeah and any um any staff who are um in the call if uh they want to offer any comments they should just raise their hand so we know so we haven't had any of our staff participating in the discussion which is okay we are not asking questions but offering the opportunity So um, if what I would suggest that we do, if uh, there's no further comments is, uh, and, and Lynn, thank you for doing this. Uh, Holly's here, has, has raised her hand. So I, Holly, I'll get you in a second, is to uh, take this document and give it a, some kind of formal status and also make sure that it's available uh, for Athena make sure that it uh, is it might make the minutes uh, function better, uh, easier for her. Holly? Hi. Um, so I just wanted to just briefly explain with the with the the costs and the revenues of the current program. The revenues are going to be pretty easy to find because there is a, a dedicated line to the rental registration. Um, fees that we collect each year. But as I briefly explained before, I will have to work with Rob Mora on the costs because the costs are just embedded within the inspections department. There's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a, a separate line. Um, you know, we do have estimates for everybody's pay, but it's going to be more than just the inspector. It's going to be the administrative people. It's going to be Rob's time. It's going to be portions of people's time. So we're going to have to come up with a with a 
you know, good faith estimate on what those costs are. There's going to be technology costs, office supply costs, other costs, where if this was to be a separate program, we would need to make sure that all of that was charged appropriately and captured. So I can work with Rob to get the estimates on costs. The estimates on revenue will be will be pretty simple, and I can pull those numbers together for you folks as well. Okay, well, thank you. So anybody else want to raise anything today about uh, the rental registration discussion? Because we do have uh, a couple other I, items to address. I, mean, I think we should just agree that, I mean, maybe we make a motion that we are officially sending this back to CRC. My question before I do that is, do we want CRC to come back to us? Uh, I'll just, without raising my hand, I'll just say yes. I mean, I'd like to see how far we can get on this because I think the cons the con um, without getting into the text, um, since we weren't asked to look at the text, um, trying to, to target this program and make it get at the problem houses has always been my concern. So trying to see how close we can get to that Lynn matters, I think, for us to say, you know, if we can't finance it without putting a huge burden on those rental units that are out there, I'm not sure there's an appetite to taking part of a share of our operating costs, our operating budget. So it, it's these are these are interactive issues for what else we're facing when we're looking at guidelines and where our spending priorities are. Okay, so. Our, so the motion is the following. The finance committee um, is asking, I'm recommending, is asking that CRC look at the rental registration bylaw as proposed and consider the following as contained in this memo. And I can make it into a memo. And report back to the finance committee. Mandy Joe, what's reasonable? Um, the 19th is pro CRC can probably have it done by its meeting on the 19th of October. Of, okay. So let's just say and and communicate this back to the finance committee um, by the end of October, by October 30th or 31st, I guess it is, 2023. I second it. Hey, excuse me. If the motion's been made and seconded, um, and uh, do we need a restatement of the motion to make sure that we have it right? Or you... I'm happy to you. I didn't hear that. You don't need to restate it. I'll use the video to make sure I capture every word. Thank you. Okay. Um, hang on just a second. Let me. Let me go. Problem with my throat too at the same time, unfortunately. Uh, let's see if we can get a uh, so the members of the committee that are present. I'd only have to, to uh, just go through second. All right, so why don't we go ahead and take a vote and um, yeah. we'll start with uh, Lynn. Aye. And uh, Anna. Anna. I'm Andy. I said aye. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, thank you, Kathy. It didn't go through. <laughs> yes. 
and I'm a yes. Uh, and we'll note uh, that Alicia is absent. And uh, that at this point, uh, we have no mem resident members to call. So the motion carries um, with four votes. Do you think uh, so it's four to zero? No input from resident members. So let me see if I can get back to the. So with that said, uh, is there anything else that we need to talk about today on rental registration? I think that we have uh, really covered it. So I can't think of anything. Then I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Um, and I think that we'll then turn on to uh, next topic, which was to see if there's any comments that people want to offer to the uh, draft of the uh, committee report that was regarding the September 8th con conversation and this in vote regarding uh, uh, council compensation, funding for council compensation. That I'm hoping everybody got a chance to look at it. All right, I will leave it at that. Um, excuse me, I'm not going to. Um, I don't think we ended up putting the document into the packet regard that you put together regarding the future plan uh, scheduling plans for the committee. Um, I think it I, is in there. I think I did put it in there, um, but Lynn, you should have it in Word as well. I do. If, uh, if you want to just... bring it up so we can look at meeting dates, because there is one, there's two dates that were an either or. And let me just so might be helpful to look at if we find it. Um, no, that's not it. Here we go. Finance. Uh, okay, I'm ready to bring it up. Um, okay. This, okay. by doing what we just did, this frees up this one. I had put in rental registration fees for the, the next few, just because I didn't know how long the committee was going to take to get through it. So you'll see that. And then the 20th and 27th was, in my mind, an either or, unless the committee wanted to consider doing both. What do you think, Andy? Kathy has her hand up. Uh, the one thing that we really need to get back to is the street light. That's my, that was my hand. Yeah. And uh, wonder if we should should we also try to look at the surplus pro real property just yes. Yeah. Uh, Dave, Dave Zomek said that he would have that for the second finance committee meeting in October. So if the committee chooses to have both the 20th and 27th, then um, please let me know which meeting you'd like to take that up so that I can ask him to be ready. So the real question is, what you're really asking is, are we going to meet on the 20th and the 27th? And or, yep. Kathy has her hand up. Yeah, Kathy. Uh, hearing Mandy say that they uh, were meeting on the 19th, I would, per, you know, for October, I would prefer meeting on the 27th to make sure 
there's enough time between now and then. It, it, since I'm seeing Ren, that's when Reynolds, and and then I have a, yeah. So I would, of those two, I would prefer that one mainly to give us enough time to give them time to work. And then mm -hmm. my question on streetlights, Andy, is we shouldn't look, I don't think we should be looking at streetlights again until it comes out of TSO, because my understanding is there were substantial revisions in it, or potentially substantial revisions, um, and that would affect the finance question questions. Um, so that should be dependent on TSO finishing. Um, so that those were my that's why my hand was up, Lynn. Just those those two uh, issues. It the referral. Good. The referral to, to um, TSO was with input from finance, so it it might be wise. The TSO committee is going not going to look at. They didn't look at streetlights this week, but they will the week after. Actually, Anna's here; she can speak to this. Um, and so I think it would be it would make the most sense for finance to give TSO input before TSO makes their final recommendation. Uh, but. Uh, let me just say, I mean, Anna can talk about it, but my understanding is that a lot of that there was a meeting to look at some of the safety standards and so that the proposal may be more expensive than what we saw the first time around and our comments. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's it. But yeah. so I so so looking at what we initially got would not would not be a good use of our time if it's going to no, come that's right that's why i'm suggesting that finance look at it after tso has had their next meeting to talk about it and then yeah. give feedback after that so that tso can make a recommendation with finance committee's input uh, and, okay. and will tso have their next meeting where they look at street lights it's going to be Sorry, one second. Uh, the 28th. Of September? This month, yeah. Okay, so we could do that on the 13th then. Okay, so here's what my suggestion is. Let's um, continue assuming we're going to meet on the 13th and the 27th and mark the 20th as tentative. And um, we'll decide on the 16th whether we need to actually meet. Uh, decide at, at, decide at the council meeting or at the on the thirteenth at the finance committee meeting. Finance committee meeting. Got it. Thank you. His committee schedule our own meetings. Is that, is that agreeable to the rest of the committee members present that we? That's, uh, that's fine with me. Tentative. And because we can always drop it, we're going to have a large burden at the end of the year when we're trying to get the guidelines done. Yep. And, then, and then my question I'll let Mandy is, know too. and if we're meeting on the 27th of October, I think, I believe the 3rd of November is the following week. So my question is, do we need that meeting? And it's, it's just a question mark, Andy, right now, because uh, surplus as I understand what's coming to us on surplus deposition, it's not going to have some of the things that I would like to set up in motion. It's just a revision of the old one. So um, I'm not, I'm seeing whether we could combine what you have for the 3rd of November and the 9th of November and have just one meeting there then. But that's, uh, I, I'm just raising it. I there, have a, there, There's no meeting on the 9th. Oh, there's no meeting on the 9th. So no. the next one would be the 13th. Okay. It's just no, two weeks. The next one would be the 17th. I got it. Okay. But it'd be, two, so it'd be two Fridays in a row if we meet on the 27th and then on the 3rd. It's just, we have That's a perfect. school building committee meeting in the morning of the 3rd, but it's all right. It's, I won't be brain dead. I can do it. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, the, we probably won't get three 
cash certification and be able to address the questions about supplemental appropriations. Uh, well, 17th would strike me as the earliest possible date of the meeting dates. Yes, the 13th of uh, the council meeting on the 13th, we are slating that to be really very much financial and uh, not have any referrals. Uh, so you're right, The seven, November 17th is when we would wrestle with that. Um, well, theoretically, if you got pre-cash certified earlier, you could take it up, uh, you could take up the supplemental appropriations earlier because they're current year, not future year. That's the pre-cash distribution questions. Yeah, but we aren't going to have free cash on the council budget on the council meeting until the 13th. Oh, uh oh, they, it's not a council question. It's a, it's a committee question. Certification of, uh, is uh, the first discussion of certificate of what to do with free cash comes into the finance committee and then to the council. Uh, okay. So you want us on 11 three or 10 27 to discuss um, i would say on 11 3 you, we could put uh that's a tentative though yeah i know uh but it won't be tentative if we haven't if free cash is certified sort of extra bullet right there Yes. Yeah, you could just leave it at that, um, if available or something like that. Uh, but we think because we don't know when free cash will be certified, that's always what the question is. So if free cash is certified prior to that date, we could start the we could have the discussion. And if it's not, that might be a meeting a reason not to meet that day at all. Yeah. That's just an easy way to handle it. Kathy has her hand up. Kathy? Um, I have a quite I, I think that's fine, but in this context, I remember what the discussion was like last time, and we didn't probably spend as long on the free clash as we might have, but one of the places we distributed to was a specific use for the regional fields. Um and is there a deadline on that? You know, if it's not used by a certain amount, does it come back to us? So it is is purely a question, Andy. Um, We'd have to research that one. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just purely a, a, a question of, of it was a big enough amount of money. Um, you know, CPA has a, it's not quite a user to lose it or use it or tell us how you're going to use it. <laughs> within a certain time period when, when yeah. they make an allocation. I think, and CPA is three years. Right, so CPA is gonna be in a similar situation on is the intent to use it or not. Um, so that was my question that it might be useful to have an answer to, Andy. I think that given what the school committee is going through right now, I'm not putting it back on their plate. I just I just want an internal answer to it because I'm thinking that it, it's money that's budgeted but unspent in two big buckets. Um, and so I think what we need to do is just ask Athena to research our motion. Yep. For, for the free for the transfers of free cash. Yes, specifically the one regarding the athletic fields. Um. I have a question. Uh, Holly, I'm glad you're still here because it sounds like the committee is considering taking up those transfers from free cash to the different stabilization funds and for athletic fields on November 3rd, which means that they would come to the council. They would need to come to the council on the last meeting in October because we usually have an initial discussion, then they go to finance, then we have our public forum on the appropriations before the council votes. Is that feasible yeah i don't think that that's what we have scheduled on our end 
that's yeah. not what we had scheduled. That's what we had, what I had plugged into the dates on the finance committee meeting calendar was what we had talked about in our internal meetings. Yeah. I, so I, I guess I'm a little bit confused. Are, are you asking about when does free cash go away or when does well, an appropriation that, that is unspent go away? I think that we got a, the, the, the uncertainty that always exists. And I don't know if you have any guidance on this whatsoever and certainly not holding you to it. But do we have an idea of when free cash might be certified? And uh, because there are things that trigger after that. But uh, yeah. and right now I don't. Yeah. So what we've been saying, Andy, is we just don't know. Um, it's going to take longer this year. We know for a fact. And we tried to put a calendar together working with Athena on what we thought were reasonable targets for the staff to hit. Um, and it sounds like what finance committee is trying to accelerate that. And I don't know we can meet that. No, well, I don't I want to accelerate it. That's yeah. that's why it's an if certified. But if it's impossible to have it happen, then we might as well not even consider it right there. The other thing I think we're debating is whether it comes to, to automatically to finance before it goes to the council, or is it presented to the council and then referred to the finance committee? What what are we? What is that? What is, free I mean, cash. We're talking about the uh, the transfers of free cash into okay. stabilization funds or any right. other spending of free cash, and those have in, those have in the past come to council for a discussion, then they go to finance committee. And finance committee has a recommendation, um, usually at the time of the public here, uh, public forum, oh, and we do the forum and the council vote on the same evening. So let me just observe that if we're going to have any extra council meetings, I mean, finance committee meetings, it may be between the 13th and the 20th. So, I mean, my hope is that it will be done by the beginning of November, but I can just not make any guarantees at this point in time. Right. And the problem, and this just is, a, it's just a quirk, okay, because of holidays and stuff like that. We meet on October 16th, and then we don't as a council meet again until the 13th. We originally were going to meet on the 6th, and then whether it was wise or not, I suggested we not. And, and, and my problem, quite frankly, is, is that once we get to the 13th and we've had the financial indicators meeting, then the pressures on the finance committee to start working on the guidelines. And I think the guidelines discussion is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy this year. It's never easy, but it's, it's not going to be easy this year either. And uh, as a consequence, I don't want to shortchange our time to work on the guidelines. So I was just trying to see if there was major things that we could push before November 13th for that very reason. And so uh, could, if we can certify by the 3rd, then we'd certainly like to start, we'd like to deal with it then. If uh, free cash isn't certified, then we'll have to just find another way. This might be an odd suggestion, but could you start working on the guidelines sooner? I mean, without the details? I mean, there's a lot of policy things in the guidelines. It's an extensive document, but does it make sense to start talking about those things that you know you're going to put into the guidelines and start to review those before you start to get into the substance of the matter? I mean, the reality is the numbers are is going to be similar to last year. They always are. Um, That's one option. Let me just suggest another one. And that is we break our custom and that on 1016, the council have a motion that refers as soon as available the certified free cash and the proposed spending of that 
to the finance committee so that the finance committee might in fact be able to discuss that on November 3rd and bring it back to the council on the 13th. It mm -hmm. does, it's doing everything a little bit backwards, but maybe that's an option. I, I, I would yeah, say if, if, that makes if, sense. I mean, if the council can do that, the council can do whatever it wants. If you want to refer something that, you know, upon the cer certification of free cash, it gets referred, you know, that's 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 doable. I think you could also say, have a, you know, read last year's finance, financial guidelines at, at one of your October meetings to get people primed on that instead of waiting for a the first draft to come through. We actually have a initial discussion at the council for the financial guidelines. Ah, okay. It's not, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not. It's for the town manager's goals, mm -hmm. but they're in in extrably linked. So we have we have a couple of if needed meetings on financial guidelines for finance committee in between the first and second discussion at council. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the it, what feels like pressure on our finance staff to get those free cash appropriations in so quickly, which is ahead of the schedule that we had planned for when um, our finance staff are, are really doing so many jobs. So I, I, I'm not gonna say that council <laughs> can't do what you're suggesting, Lynn, but I think in consideration of our staff who are, who are really working hard to get everything done, I think that might feel very uncomfortable for them. I don't think that's what it's intended, and I would uh, yeah, no, I, hope totally it, I hope that it uh, wasn't what we're what we were merely saying is when free cash is certified, can we find a way to get the finance committee working on it as quickly as possible. We absolutely don't want to put any pressure on the staff to get free cash certified any faster to satisfy the committee. We just, so it's, uh, that's not what was intended. So so why not, if, if it does get certified, you can add it to the agenda at the time versus, I mean, right now it looks like a target. Um, so, yeah. The only thing we need to make sure is that there is a motion here that allows us to look at it before the next council meeting. It, and it can be a simple motion. If I, 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 I don't know what that I don't know what that buys you, Lynn. I mean, if if the vote is is scheduled for November thirteenth, right? The referral motion. Yeah. It buys us the ability. To look at it before the council discusses it. Uh, Andy, I'm going to suggest another option here, and that is that we may have to have two finance committee meetings in one week during the week of uh, November uh, 13th. Uh, <laughs> I think we've gone as far as we can go right now. I'm not sure we're going to solve this. I agree. So why don't we leave it as a discussed item without um, a res without a final resolution? Do you want me to leave this initial discussion if certified up here or not? You can leave it there because we, if we, if it's not certified, it's a meaningless item. Okay. So, Got it. Hey there. Um, just quickly, so we can finish up. 
I did review the minutes of that are listed on the agenda for today of April 18, May 5th, and May 9th of 2023. I have versions of those minutes which have um, corrections uh, in uh, word format with uh, uh, that are available. Uh, they were just done over the last couple of days. Um, none of the uh, corrections that I have made, the amendments that I've uh, inserted are significant. Um, they're all uh, sort of word, one word changes, um, um, corrections on how things were designated but not substantive. So um, it's up to the committee whether you want to go ahead and approve minutes as amended, or if you want me to, I can send you the track version and you can look at the changes themselves, uh, whichever you prefer. And if there's no one to make right. um, why don't you go ahead and um make the motion? Uh okay, well I'm, then I would move to um adopt minutes for April 18, 2023, May 5th, 2023, and May 9th, 2023 as amended. of the chair. Second. Okay, this motion made and seconded uh, without any further discussion. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Anna? And um, yes, so that's done. And uh, I don't think we have any unanticipated business, so uh, Andy, I have just a quick uh, suggestion on minutes. When the draft, a super draft is available, can you put it in the packet so we can all, so, so maybe the drafts aren't just, I looked, we've kind of, we're slow on minutes, um, but I don't mind seeing a rough draft in the packet. Um, I, I like what you're doing. I'm just saying that if there are drafts, go ahead and post them. So if people- there are, there, It is in the packet. Oh, so everything's been posted where there's a draft. So we're, because I didn't see July and August yet. So it's just we're behind on getting. Uh, no, the ones that are listed for approval. Nothing's listed for approval on minutes that hasn't been provided in the packet to the committee. Okay. I'm. So if there's a draft, it's not listed for approval yet because it hasn't, something hasn't happened or there isn't even a draft. Kathy, I think I put a bunch of drafts in an earlier finance committee folder. I can go back and check. Okay. Okay. Um, so and then, and then Andy had, and then Andy and I had talked about just doing a few at a time. So there weren't quite so many for the committee to be looking at every single meeting. So we're trying to slowly catch up. That's the idea here. But I think if you go back and look at a couple meetings ago, there were maybe seven different drafts in there. Okay. So, okay. um, you're answering my question, Athena. I can I can go look at it because a couple of times I just want to go to them rather than go to Zoom. That's perfect. I can do that. No okay. problem. And if you're looking for a, a draft that that you can't find online, just let me know and I'll I'll get you whatever draft I have. Thanks. I didn't mean to take up any time on this, but no thanks. Worries. Okay. So I don't think that there's any other business for today, and therefore we're adjourned. Okay. Have a great week. Thanks. Thank you.